You are listening to Diasport Music on Black Power 96 with Melinda Francis, uh, Norman uh, Richmond, uh, Lisa Watson on the buttons, and Dr. Gerald Horn is getting ready to uh, speak. And Dr. Uh, Gerald Horn is the uh, African American historian, African historian, who holds the John Jay and, uh, John Jay and Rebecca Moore's chair of. Uh, History and African American Studies at the University of Houston, and he is the author of uh, so many books. I don't even want to. Uh, I don't even about fifty books, uh, nearly. And uh, what is it, what is your latest book, sir? My you write them so much. You might have written. The reason I said that is because you probably you might have published something uh, since we spoke last week. No, my latest books are Acknowledging Radical <laughs> Histories, Conversations with Gerald Horn, and I Dare Say a Gerald Horn Reader. And next up is Armed Struggle, question mark. Panthers and communists, black nationalists and liberals in Southern California through the 60s and 70s. And to that end, I'll be in Lamert Park, Los Angeles on February 3rd, 2024, in the afternoon, addressing the two previous published books and a bit on the unpublished book. Uh, yes, I spoke, spoke to my cousin Donald Williams, and he told me to tell you that he would be there uh, with his red suit on, like uh, uh, Johnny Moore, Johnny Moore said. He he is he was he's been there every time you come to LA, and uh, he purchases all of your books. So. You'll, you'll at least sell two or three copies from him. Right on. All right, you want to begin, uh, Melinda? Yeah, um, we're we're a little behind, um, but um, we haven't talked about Ukraine in a while, so I don't know if you wanted to sort of start there. Well, yes. First of all, the headline, and you heard it here first, because. I think this is going to be a blockbuster. The blockbuster is not that Ukraine is losing. Even the bourgeois press in North America acknowledges that reality. The blockbuster is what I expect to emerge as a result of this loss. First of all, with the orange man, Donald Trump, slated possibly to return to the White House in January 2025, and with his stated goal of draining the swamp at NATO headquarters in Brussels, possibly pulling the United States out of NATO, uh, that's going to lead to a number of other consequences. Now, of course, this pulling out of NATO, once again, that's not the blockbuster, because he has made that clear. The New York Times has been wringing its hands about that there for weeks, if not months now. But I think the consequences of that are going to be tremendous because, number one, Joska Fischer, a leader and founder of the Green Party in Germany, which is now part of the ruling coalition led by Chancellor Schultz, has floated the idea of the European Union developing nuclear weapons, which is just code for Germany developing nuclear weapons, which will be seen as a red flag to the bull in Moscow, given their torturous diplomatic relations, not least during World War II when Berlin was responsible for the slaughter of millions of individuals in the former Soviet Union. That's going to be of enormous consequence if Berlin moves in that direction, which is possible. But the real blockbuster after this uh, rather elongated uh, preface is that if NATO begins to disintegrate, you should expect France to cut a deal with Russia against the interests of the United States. And now this will be taking place at a moment when Mr. Trump himself will be trying to cut a deal with Russia so that the United States can focus like a laser beam on China. Uh, the major difference between the two parties, the Democrats and Republicans, is precisely on that level. The Democrats, for reasons that we can go into if you're interested, are trying to focus on 
Russia and China simultaneously, uh, which is a fool's errand. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that, as we stated previously, the black American constituency, which is the bulwark of the Democratic Party, has been forced to steer away from foreign policy, which then gives more impetus to the hawks in the Democratic Party, which leads them to that kind of harebrained scheme. Whereas the Republicans were heavily dependent, to put it mildly, upon Euro-American voters across class lines, can be more focused and targeted and perhaps even realistic. So that ultimately will put Russia in a kind of catbird seat, being appealed to by both France and the United States, not to mention China, not to mention India, which will be a kind of radical turnabout from the Cold War years when it was being targeted by the United States, by France, by Germany, and ultimately by China, which it seems to me was the tipping point with regard to the dissolution of the Soviet Union. And that then in turn will put pressure on Canada, which as we've said last week, has less than ideal relations with India, with China, with Russia, and if Trump comes back into office with the United States too. So will that force Canada to try to cut a deal with Russia? Somehow I don't think so. Uh, not least because looking at Ottawa, I don't see that much vision in terms of the crafting of foreign policy, but also because in the prairie provinces, Alberta in particular, you have this secessionist impulse. And also in the prairie provinces, you have a strong block of voters with roots in Eastern Europe, many of whom are anti-communist immigrants, uh, point to your number two, Christopher Freeland, in the first instance. And so this will leave Canada with quite a dilemma that is roaring down the pike within the next year or so. And in foreign policy terms, that's equivalent to saying that it's right around the corner. So oh, you're listening to Diaspora Music with Dr. Gerald Horn. Now, I suggest that people uh, read Eve Engler in terms of Canadian foreign policy. He's written several books. He also has a blog, and he commentates almost daily on uh, foreign affairs, Canadian uh, on Canadian foreign policy. Eve Engler, and there is a sister, and I'm having a serious senior moment. A uh, sister uh, out of Montreal, and she has a a blog. I'll, I'll not a, uh, Google it before we get off the air and, and, and give give you her name. But uh, there are some fine uh, uh, journalists in, in in Canada that are dealing with Canadian and Canadian foreign policy from a progressive and a leftist point of view. And uh, I think people need to know who, who they are. Uh, uh, the, do you know the sister? Can you remember the sister's name in Montreal, Melinda, that has has the uh, uh, the think think tank on the foreign policy? She's a young sister, about your age, Melinda. Um, you have to give me more more references. I'm 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 not sure who you. I'll go. I'll I'll, I'll 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 before we come get off the air. I'll I'll. I'll I'll do some googling. And I'll find out who she is. I hope hope to get her her, her name before we 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 we, uh, we sign off. Uh, okay. But uh, Cynthia Cynthia McKinney, Doctor Horn, had it, it had a lot of problems in terms of being in the Democratic Party, trying to talk about the uh, the international situation, and uh, I think her husband might be uh, uh, her former husband, a husband. I know she has a, a, has a son that has a Jamaican father. And she was married to a brother from fr from Jamaica, and uh, I guess you've always pointed out that uh, you know any time that a, a a black person from the United States deals with foreign policy, they uh, uh, you, you might meet the fate of a uh, Du Bois or Paul Robeson or uh, worse than that, Huey Newton or uh, Fred Hampton. Could you reflect on that? Well, you're raising a point that's highly relevant at this precise moment, because, as you know, the United States just vetoed a resolution in the United Nations Security Council 
that would have called for a ceasefire in terms of this massacre this Israel, Israelis are perpetrating in Gaza. And what's remarkable there is a number of points. Uh, it represents a failure on so many different levels. Uh, let's deal internally in the United States in the first instance. First of all, you have the Zionist lobby, which puts pressure upon black elected officials in particular. They're going to spend millions to defeat a number of them in the November 2024 elections. Then you have black intellectuals who hide under their desks because they don't want to be excoriated or worse by the Zionist lobby. I'm looking in particular at Harvard University, whose president is a woman of Haitian origin, speaking of Claudine Gay. She had an appearance on Capitol Hill in the last few days, and she was trapped and snookered along with the now gone president of the University of Pennsylvania. What I mean by that is that a viral clip suggested that they would not be critical of the idea of genocide against Jewish Americans. Now, this was a truncated clip. The precursor to the question was a debate and discussion as to whether or not chanting from the river to the sea was genocidal, whether the very concept of intifada was genocidal. Obviously, those are problematic questions. And then that led into the next question about uh, genocide against Jewish people in general. Now, what's interesting about that, of course, is that it was demagogic in the first instance, pushed by Republicans. And by the way, in the state of Texas, the Republican Party has ruled that they will not steer clear of Holocaust deniers or neo-Nazis. They're now part of the coalition. And yet, when we're talking about so-called anti-Semitism, the focus is on the presidents of these Ivy League universities, which then feeds in to the right-wing populism of the Republican Party, where supposedly they're against the elites and a favor of the common folk. And in the 19th century, that meant that uh, they were, that is to say their political predecessors, were in favor of taking the land from the Native Americans and dispersing it to Euro-Americans fresh off the boat. Now, I had expected black intellectuals at Harvard, of which there are quite a few, to weigh in on this, but they are all hiding under their desks. And what's remarkable there is about 30 years ago, there was a controversy at the University of Pennsylvania where a young Israeli student shouted at black women members of a sorority, Delta Sigma Theta, that they were, quote, water buffaloes, unquote. And they got upset, needless to say, it led to a debate about free speech. Of course, the same people who are denouncing the president of the University of Pennsylvania for supposedly not being tougher on anti-Semitism were giving a lot of leeway and latitude to this Israeli student. Uh, speech codes were crafted that made it simpler and easier to engage in anti-blackness. And this particular student was let off the hook. And the problem now, and I expected one of these Harvard professors to point this out, is that they're trying to employ a so-called speech code that was used to facilitate anti-blackness in a context where it's being crafted to be directed at Jewish American students, who of course are part of a, a privileged group insofar as they've been inducted into the hollow halls of whiteness. And so let's put a demerit in the column of black intellectuals and professors at Harvard uh, who will not only not defend the black woman professor, pr president, excuse me, of Harvard, but ultimately they're not even defending themselves <laughs> because they're obviously next on the chopping block, but they're so busy hiding that they don't even realize it. And then of course, there is the international position of US imperialism in light of it being joined at the hip, joined umbilically with the Israeli war criminals. I think that this puts the leaders in the White House, the State Department and the Pentagon in legal jeopardy, being accomplices and aiders and abettors of war crimes. But more than this, it also tarnishes the already damaged reputation of US imperialism 
there are boycotts already in West Asia and parts of North Africa targeting the emblems of U.S. imperialism. I think I mentioned last week that at a McDonald's restaurant in Istanbul, a protester let loose mice in the McDonald's, sending uh, customers scurrying hither and yon. And so you see a real crisis for U.S. imperialism at a time when just this past week, Vladimir Putin was greeted like a visiting potentate in both United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia. Uh, they did more than roll out the red carpet. Then he flew back to Moscow and met with the president of Iran, uh, speaking of President Raisi. Also, we've received the news that the Iranian ally in Yemen, which abuts the Red Sea, will be targeting any ships headed towards Israel, uh, which is going to increase insurance costs for those shipping goods and items to Israel. Already, despite this happy talk coming out of Israel about how they're giving Hamas a beatdown, the fact of the matter is, is that a good deal of northern Israel has been deserted because they cannot absorb the missiles coming across the border from southern Lebanon from another Iranian ally, speaking of Hezbollah. Ditto for southern Israel, deserted because they cannot absorb the missiles uh, being shot from Gaza. And so you have all of these people who are now in hotels in the center of Israel, around Tel Aviv, for example. That is unsustainable because the government has to pick up the tab. Ultimately, the U.S. taxpayer, people like myself, are picking up the tab. And so this is leading to an all-around crisis. It's forcing... U.S. imperialism and the war criminals in Israel to consider widening the conflict by attacking Iran, one of the reasons why President Raisi was in Moscow. In other words, uh, this could trigger World War III, which brings me finally to a critique of the U.S. left, which I've mentioned more than once. They've made sort of a sport of critiquing and attacking what they consider to be black nationalism, affixing the descriptor identity politics identitarian to any form of black self-assertion. But most of these jokers have not said a mumbling word about Jewish nationalism, which, by the way, was a preoccupation of the left in the first half of the 20th century, that is to say, critiquing saying. But these jokers in the U.S. left today, they have little or nothing to say, even though we know as we speak that Jewish nationalism has led the world to the brink of World War III. And whatever one can say about black nationalism is basically they're just talking about a U.S. thing. And certainly we can't say that black nationalism is leading the world to the brink of World War III. So this has been a massive failure on so many different sides, on the part of U.S. imperialism, on the part of black intellectuals, and black professors, on the part of the U.S. left, on the part of the Israelis, and of course, uh, I would also say the Israeli populace as a whole, which is massively turned to the right in light of October 7th, facilitating these war crimes against Gaza that continue as we speak, because it's apparent that the Israelis would either A, want to make Gaza not inhabitable, but chasing the millions away, or starving or otherwise making sure that they wind up in graves, or B, uh, engage in a various kinds of ethnic cleansing on the West Bank, where, by the way, despite its mealy mouth protestations about Israel protecting civilians, the United States continues to ship bunker-busting bombs to the war criminals, not to mention rifles used by the 800,000 strong settlers on the West Bank to engage in what we call retail ethnic cleansing, uh, chasing Palestinians out of their homes and, from the Israeli point of view, into the Sinai Desert in Egypt. I should also make another point, which is that another consequence of this massive fail with regard to historic Palestine is that it's going to shake the very foundations of these so-called pro-Israeli regimes, starting with Morocco, in North Africa, which signed these ill-fated Abraham Accords, knocked together by the 45th U.S. president, 
uh, to Bahrain, uh, heading east, where you've had uh, the hosting of U.S. military officials. And if you read between the lines, uh, you can see that Qatar, which has been playing a very slick game, I must say, uh, on the one hand, hosting U.S. military <laughs> on their soil, at the same time, uh, being a, a kind of bagman for Hamas, uh, bringing suitcases full of U.S. dollars to Hamas up until October 7th. And of course, that's winked at by the Israelis because they thought it was a keen idea. It was a neat idea to have uh, two contending forces, the Palestinian Authority on the West Bank, Hamas in Gaza, and that you could play one off against the another. And also Gutter sponsors Al Jazeera, which is really the go-to station, I must say. It, it's almost like Palestinian CNN, quite frankly. Uh, I, I recommend it. And they, they, did a, a, they did a bad job on Ukraine, you might recall, but they sort of recovered with regard to this present crisis. And here's another prediction. There's going to be increasing pressure on Gutter, and I think they realize it. And so I expect them to embrace Iran more closely, embrace the Saudis more closely. Recall that they have had various snits and disputes with the Saudis over the years. The last one was during the Trump years when they were basically rescued by the Turks. So I expect them also to embrace the Turks more closely, which will present just another dilemma for the crisis of U.S. imperialism. Uh, let me say that uh, I have been uh, accused of identity politics, and uh, I keep on repeating this all the time. I remember that uh, when Angela Davis came to uh, Toronto in 1972, it was on the day that my father passed away, and the left, some of them who became my, some of my closest friends, refused to let me in to hear uh, Angela Davis because I was supposed to be uh, uh, this reverse racist, this black nationalist, and, you know, as if, uh, you know, the black nationalists had state power. So they sent me, uh, I had to go listen to Bobby Blue Bland. I couldn't, I couldn't hear Angela Davis. That was in uh, 1972. I never will forget that as, as long as, uh, as I live. Well, a sign of the times and a sign of today's times, too, I'm afraid. Uh, yes, sir. Now, let me uh, say, let me, uh, be, 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 I want to say this, Belinda. Uh, uh, Lula uh, has uh, wants to mediate uh, Guyana and, and, and Venezuela. Uh, I hope that's not it, it, interfering with anything you want to see, Melinda. No, no, that's, that's fine. I, that's what I was going to do. Go on to the next thing. Yeah, so great. Yes, it's, it's a real crisis. Um, I, I've spoken to this issue on WPFW, the yeah. program on the ground, which comes on Friday mornings uh, at WPFWFM.org. And my commentary is now posted, I believe, on Facebook, which elaborates on what I'm about to say, which is that Venezuela argues that with regard to the disputed region, disputed in their mind, Essequibo, which is now Guyanese territory, that when that was adjudged to be the case in the late 19th century, that Caracas was going up against the mighty British Empire and were disadvantaged. Now they say the time has come to adjust or correct in their mind this position. But what it's leading to is that Guyana, which is about 20 times smaller in population, then Venezuela has not only had had not only have this deal with Exxon, the U.S. Uh, petroleum giant headquartered in my neck of the woods in Texas, but also Pentagon officials have been dropping into Georgetown in the past few days. Uh, I trust and I hope that President Lula will be able to mediate, and if not President Lula, perhaps the Cuban comrades, since they have good relations with both uh, Georgetown uh, and Caracas. But in any way, this is a brewing crisis. And uh, you have been to uh, uh, Guyana. 
uh, yourself, am I correct? I, well, I'm, I know I'm correct. Uh, you've had some dealings in Guyana personally, right? You know, I was an observer at the trial of Walter Rodney uh, some decades ago. I was there just before he was slain, apparently at the behest of the Georgetown authorities. It was, I was very impressed with Guyana. And, and, and as a matter of fact, going to Guyana had a, a catalytic impact upon my own consciousness, just being around these premier intellectuals, not only Walter Rodney, but Chetty Jagan, who I came to know, who was that time the leader of the opposition, later becoming, he was formerly the leader, head of state, and then becomes head of state once again. And uh, it's, it's just their discipline uh, left a deep imprint upon me. What they were reading left a deep imprint upon me. And uh, I trust and I hope that cooler heads will prevail and that there will be no military conflict between Caracas and Georgetown. Uh, let me say the same thing about, uh, let me do say ditto to that about Guyana, because when I came uh, to uh, Toronto, I was embraced by uh, the Guyanese, with the, uh, well, I guess it was Antiguans and the no, the Guyanese were the first people that em, that that embraced me. Uh, gave me some high wine, which I couldn't drink. I used to told them to take that and put that in their car, but uh, they they fed me before they had me drink the high wine. But uh, they had a profound influence on on, on me. John, Jan Carew, George Dash, uh, uh, Brenda. Uh, well, I forgot the sister. Oh my goodness. Uh, there's a uh, Ruth. I keep, I'm, 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 uh, she used to go with Rosie Douglas. I have a senior moment, but men and women from Guyana had a profound uh, effect on me uh, uh, intellectually, and they were the first people to really take me in. Uh, uh, you know, put me up in their homes and stuff. So I have a profound uh, re uh, respect for the. Uh, for Guyana and the Guyanese, not and you know I, I, I was blessed to have spent a little bit of time with uh, with Walter Rodney uh, and uh, and uh, as well as Patricia Rodney. So I can, as Smokey would say, I second that emotion, sir. Right on. Yeah, oh, I'm, I cut you off, Melinda. You I, have something you want to say? I don't know. I, I don't know where you want to go. Um, do you want to just comment um, that, you know, Kissinger finally died? Well, as the late comic Moms Mabley once said, if you can't say something good about a person after they passed away, you shouldn't say anything. So I will say Kissinger died good. That is to say that this former U.S. Secretary of State and National Security Mandarin died at the age of 100. Uh, he was a war criminal, never brought to justice. I focused quite a bit upon his machinations in Southern Africa after the liberation of Mozambique and Angola, with the Cuban troops being dispatched to the latter in order to foil an invasion from apartheid South Africa. He never forgave or forgot what the Cubans did and even though it's been a consistent policy since 1959, excuse me, from Washington to destabilize the Cuban Revolution, it went into overdrive during the Kissinger years in the mid 1970s. And also, he set a new standard with regard to cashing in on a policy you have effectuated. That is to say that he was responsible for engineering the Entente with the People's Republic of China some 50 odd years ago. After he left office, he became a door opener for US corporations seeking to invest in China and made a fortune in the process. And of course, the Chinese are very thankful to Henry Kissinger for helping to build up their economy. But as with many catastrophes concerning US foreign policy, it was uh, bipartisan to use the Washington term. That is to say that relations with China took a great leap forward, as the Chinese would say, and under Democrat Jimmy Carter, who appointed as the first official U.S. ambassador to China, the United Auto Workers official, Leonard Woodcock, a leader of a union, who then helped to shepherd 
manufacturing jobs from North America into China. And he too benefited handsomely from that process. So this is one of the reasons why so many voters in this country are cynical, do not participate in the electoral process because they see this kind of glad handing that leads to politicians stuffing their pockets with filthy lucre and ill-gotten gains. And this is just one more aspect of the continuing crisis of U.S. imperialism. The name that you just mentioned, was he the, was he the, that went to China? He was the head of the UAW, right? Leonard Woodcock. He was at once time leader of the UAW. That's what, uh, am I correct in saying that? You are correct. And I guess this last thing I say is that as General Gordon Baker used to always say, the UAW stands for you ain't white. That is, uh, a general was one of those people that the white left would call the, uh, he divided the working class because he was a black nationalist. But, uh, Identitarian. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah. But uh, yeah, General Gordon Baker was a had gone to Cuba. Uh, I guess when he when he joined the ancestors, uh, they couldn't say that about him. Uh, he was supporting Albania when he joined the ancestors, so I guess he became from a black nationalist to a, uh, I guess the uh, traditional left would refer to him as which that would be an ultra leftist. I guess at that point, wouldn't it? Wouldn't they say that? Uh, likely so. <laughs> Is there anything else you'd like to add, uh, comrade? Well, only that Shohei Otani, the great baseball player, pitcher, and hitter, formerly of the LA Angels in Anaheim, is signing with the Dodgers, becoming the highest paid athlete probably in the history of sports, any field. Ten year contract, right. $700 million. Uh, too bad for the Toronto Blue Jays. They were. Uh, let me say this uh, before I, before we hang up. Yeah, they were. They they, they were the sports station here. I listened to the sports channel for uh, you know hours, and they were waiting for him to you know to uh, uh, you know uh, land in Toronto, and he never did. So I guess uh, seven hundred million dollars. I don't think the uh, the Blue Jays can could could uh could handle that, but Cito Gaston I guess is uh getting a lot of accolades in 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 the baseball world too. Cito Gaston, the two-time world champion, who was the uh, manager of the Blue Jays, and also a great uh, baseball player himself. I think he was mentored by uh, the great Hank Aaron, if I'm not mistaken. Hmm. And with that. Uh, I'd like to thank you, and we will see you in the whirlwind, sir. And uh, anything you would like to add, uh, um, uh, Melinda? Um, take your, take all those people who are in the, the northern um, hemisphere. Take your vitamin D. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. All okay. right. Thank Lisa for technical brilliance per usual, and. Uh, and take your vitamins.